Glory to your name, Jesus. God, you are worthy to be praised, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's been a good God. Oh, God. Hallelujah. If you're glad to be in his service this morning. Is anybody glad to be in his service this morning? Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together and magnify the God of our salvation. Oh, hallelujah. You can do better than that to your life. Hallelujah. Let's magnify the God of our salvation. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. In the name of
Thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. We run to you this morning. Oh, we cry out to you, Jesus, and we come to you, lifting up our hands in praise, pouring ourselves out before you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's honey in the dark, water in the snow, manna on the ground, no matter where I go, I don't need to
have to worry. You don't have to worry this morning. Hallelujah. You don't have to worry this morning. The Bible says in Psalm 61, verse 2, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Has anybody found that rock in this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. Can I get a testimony, a, 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 a witness this morning that he's been a rock of my salvation? Yeah. Hallelujah. He's the rock of my salvation. He has all that I need. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. I just want to, let's just take a time, just raise our hands up. Lift our hands up to the Lord, to the God of our salvation. Just lift them up. Hallelujah. Oh, fill after them this morning. Just, just hallelujah. Lift your hands up to them. Yes, Jesus. Now open up your mouth. Hallelujah. Let's extol him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Let's exalt the God of our salvation. Hallelujah. Open up your mouth. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, from the depths of your mouth. Hallelujah, from the depths of your heart, let, let your mouth speak. Tell them how much you love them this morning. Tell them how much you mean to you. Hallelujah, thank them for their last blessings. Hallelujah, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, the word says, the word of faith is not thee, even in thy mouth. Hallelujah, sometimes we just got to open up our mouth and talk to the Lord, hallelujah. Just tell him how much he means to us, how much, all the things that he's done for us. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It is prayer time in the house. Hallelujah, he has all that we need. Sometimes we search everywhere else, but to the rock where we should go at the first, amen. Hallelujah, but oh, what needless pain we bear sometimes. Hallelujah, because we don't carry everything to God in prayer, amen. If you have a need in your body, if you want to stand in the gap for a family member, come on down and the, the ministers, if y'all can prepare yourself, we will anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. Hallelujah. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. And I, I just believe that God will hear from heaven. Hallelujah. I believe that God desire to do a great work amongst his people. Hallelujah. I, des I believe that God want all the glory. Hallelujah. No matter what the report is, no matter what the situation look like, I believe God is going to undertake. Hallelujah. In that situation. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Word said we can come boldly. Hallelujah. God, we come in boldly before your throne of grace, God. In the time of need, Lord God, your people need you this morning. Hallelujah. We need you, God, to attain strength, God. We need you to attain mercy this morning, Jesus. Some of our hearts are overwhelmed, God. Oh, God. This world has left a bitter taste in our mouth, God. But God, we know that you're sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. Hallelujah, we come looking for you, God, to be the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord. Hallelujah, we come to commit our way unto you this morning. God, you said we commit our way to you, you will bring it to pass, Lord. Now, everyone out of our own, our own it, God, our own issue, Lord God. But there is nothing in this house, God, that is too much for you, Lord. There's nothing in this house, God, that is too hard for you, Lord God. God, we plead your blood this morning. Hallelujah. Let your blood cover this morning. Let it prevail in the name of Jesus. God, you were, hallelujah, beaten for our iniquities and bruised for our transgressions, God. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon you, God. Some of us just might need peace this morning. Hallelujah, your word saying we keep our minds stayed upon you, God, that you will keep us in perfect peace. Keep us, Lord God. Keep us from illness, Lord. Keep us, God, from a backslidden mind, God. Keep us, God, in strength, Lord God. God, we live and move and have our being in you, Jesus. Oh, God, touch our family members, God. Hallelujah, your word said you're looking for an intercessor, God. Hallelujah, find, hallelujah, the intercessor here in this house this morning. God, we come to touch and agree to call upon your name. Hallelujah, have an anticipation, Lord God, knowing what you're able to do, Lord God. 
Hallelujah. It's no secret, God, that you are faithful. God, it's no secret, God, that you are a healer. Hallelujah. It ain't no secret you can restore and mend broken hearts, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, in your name we pray. Lord, in your name we pray. anybody found them to be enough this morning. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness that he's enough this morning? How many glad that the name of the Lord is a strong tower? Hallelujah. He's a strong tower where the righteous can run in and be safe. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of our God. Hallelujah. There's a sweet presence of the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. He made us to sit in heavenly places. Hallelujah. We want to thank God. Thank God for seeing another day. Thank God for his new mercies. Amen. Anybody got new mercies? Hallelujah. New mercies. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to prepare ourselves to give this morning. Hallelujah. We thank God for being a provider, being all that we need. And we're going to take our substance and continue to worship him. Amen. Let's pray over this offering. Lord God, we thank you. We magnify you, Lord God. Oh God, I thank you, Lord. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread, Lord God. God, we ask you right now, God, that you bless, break, and multiply what we give to you, Lord. Let it meet every obligation, God. Let it have uh, room to, to run over, Lord God, and bless, Lord God. We ask in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord in Jesus' name. Until it's good 
no love. We're talking about Jesus. We're saying, hello, Jesus. Right now, here I am in the midst of my fear, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my struggles. I can say goodbye to fear. I can say goodbye to my pain. I can say goodbye to my sorrows. That doesn't mean life's going to be easier. The hardships are still there. But when I say, Jesus, hello, that gives me the strength. When I say, Jesus, hello, hello, love. Hello. Well, see, fear is not my future. Fear is not my future. thankful today for that new horizon could you lift up your praise unto God right now come on lift up your praise unto God right now there's a new horizon there's a new day there's a new day hallelujah there's a new day in Jesus come on that's it come on that's it clap your hands unto the Lord all you people hallelujah hallelujah Come on, let's clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, my, I feel the peace of God in this place. Come on, let's lift up our hands unto the Lord right now. Thank you, precious Jesus. Oh, peace, peace. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray in fact.
just thank him today for that precious peace, that wonderful peace that comes down from heaven above. Oh, for the Lord is good. And his name is to be praised. Oh, we thank God, we thank God, we thank God, we thank God. I want you to know that the peace of God is going to prevail. The peace of God is going to prevail. You better put your hope in that because that's what's going to stand the test of time. The peace of Almighty God is going to prevail. And we give him praise today. I would like to invite your attention this morning to the gospel according to John, the 16th chapter. And I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture, verses 20 through 33. They're not, it's, it's, there's several verses there, but they're, we'll get through them here. But I want to read them in your hearing. I want to just try to speak to you today something that I feel the Lord has, uh, would have us to hear. And John chapter 16, beginning with verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Hallelujah. And I've got my baby grandson here today. We praise God for that. Amen. Joel Ezra. Amen. So this is very special to our family, this truth here. As soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And you know, therefore, you now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whithersoever, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I have come out from God. I came forth from the world, from the Father, and come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Ah, I'm of good cheer today. And I want to speak to you on the subject, Proverbs, Parables, and Perilous Times. Proverbs, par Parables, and Perilous Times. Could we lift up our voices unto the Lord and ask His blessing upon the preaching of the Word? God, I thank You. I thank You for every person that has gathered into this place. I thank You for Your Word that gives us light that gives us life. I pray in Jesus' name that you will draw us near to you and help us to learn of you. I pray that your word would have free course today. Speak to our hearts and help us in the name of Jesus to know you in a greater way. Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will bring peace into this house. Oh God, we give you praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. When I say Proverbs, it is most likely that what comes to your mind if you have studied much of the Bible, maybe even if you have a casual acquaintance with the Bible, 
maybe what comes to your mind when I mention the word Proverbs is a poetic book in the middle of the Bible situated near Psalms, a book that is known as the Proverbs of King Solomon. And these are pithy one-liners, wise sayings, good principles, something that you and I know are, are good to live by. And that may be what comes to your mind and that would be accurate. <laughs> when I say the word parables, Perhaps what comes to your mind are those beautiful stories that have been told by Jesus while he walked the earth, ministered to people and taught his disciples. He spoke to them in what are called parables. And, and you know of some of these great parables, parables like the Good Samaritan that we have we have labeled these parables. We've summed them up and given them our own titles, if you please. The Good Samaritan, uh, the Prodigal Son, the uh, One uh, Sheep that the night, if I were to mention among those that have studied the Word of the Lord very much, if I were to mention the 90 and 9, you would know what I was talking about from the parables of Jesus uh, because uh, it would be a reference to the 90 and 9 sheep in the wilderness that he left to go look for the one lost lamb and brought that one lost lamb back to the 90 and 9 in the wilderness. These are truths and principles and little glimpses into the nature of God that were given to us through parabolic teaching. And, and even if I were to say uh, uh, concerning Proverbs, if I were to say the proverbial as an adjective, I, I may refer to some kind of a cliche, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface that cliche by saying it is the proverbial uh, such and such. You would know that I'm saying it is, a, it is a, a cliche that has been coined and passed down through generations to be understood and help us understand a particular principle. Uh, Proverbs and parables are very similar to one another. In fact, in some places in the scripture, they are interchangeable, completely interchangeable, no difference at all. Uh, but if there is a difference in the nuance between a proverb and a parable, uh, it, it could probably be most often recognized as being the proverb, uh, being the, uh, the, the principle summarized into a sentence or into a contrast between one end of the spectrum and the other so that you can really see the truth of a thing. Or the parable may be a little more elongated in its depiction of a particular principle. Uh, the parable might involve a whole story, uh, complete with a, a plot and characters and a subplot and, and then finally a, a conclusion. And so this is, this is, these are Proverbs and parables. And the Bible describes, uh, we have a whole book called Proverbs. And, and there are many Proverbs throughout the word of the Lord. And, and I, love the, I love the word Proverbs because not only is it uh, pithy one-liners and wise sayings, as I mentioned, but it also, the etymology of it is a pretty powerful, pretty powerful thing. Proverbs or pre-verbs. Uh, before verbs or before action. These are good things to think about before you take an action. These are good things to have settled in your spirit, to, to really take your time and understand the principles of a thing, to understand how you should act, how you should live. And that's what Proverbs are designed to do. They're designed to catch you before you make mistakes. Now we thank God for his mercy. We thank God for the redemption of Christ. We thank God for his blood that washes away our sins. But I'll tell you, there's also a beautiful thing about him catching us before we make a mistake. And wise is the person who will obey the Proverbs and, and recognize before the problems begin, hey, there are some things I can do to even avoid putting myself in certain situations. So this is what the Proverbs are for. And in fact, uh, the, 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 
the very first chapter of the book of Proverbs tells us this, uh, verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom, to know instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. I love that, that way of describing it to perceive the words of understanding. This, this means it's different than just knowing something. It's, that's when you start getting into the nuance of, of a thing. When you begin to perceive, you, you, you catch. Somebody said one time, some things are taught, some things are caught. And what they mean is that some things are put on the, on the chalkboard and, and you can teach them, but then there, there are other things that are never placed upon the chalkboard, but they are imparted to you through example, through observation, through life experience, and you catch them and nobody ever articulated them to you. And this would be along the lines of perceiving the words of understanding, recognizing without anybody having to say something, we would call it common sense. And there's a difference between common sense sometimes and conventional wisdom. Uh, they can be the same thing, uh, but, but sometimes a common sense is of greater value than even conventional wisdom. But to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity, to give, listen to this, to give subtlety to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion. Subtlety is usually not used in a positive context, but here it is used in a positive context. And it's, it's again, it's referring to the intangibles of teaching. It's referring to the stuff that is caught that, that nobody ever spelled out for you. Uh, business minds may call it the it factor. Uh, they may say that person has got it. What are they talking about? They're talking about the subtleties. They're talking about the stuff that nobody had to sit you down and say, this, 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 and this. You were observant. You were perceptive. You were careful in the way you flowed and you waited before you made decisions until you had a confidence to do so. And, and, and so the wise man Solomon says, these proverbs are designed to give subtlety to the simple or to the person who doesn't know very much. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Discretion is another reference to that subtlety. It's another reference to that it factor. Discretion, when, when you may not, what, what do you use when you don't have a, a, an absolute statute for what to do in a particular case? What do you use when you don't have a decree about how to address a certain thing? You use discretion. Discretion fills in the blanks. Discretion fills in the voids, that, that the loopholes that people just could not fill in because understanding and wisdom and knowledge it is a spiritual thing. And the natural efforts of man cannot fill in all of the spiritual holes. So the wise man says the Proverbs are designed to do that. They're designed to so lay down principle into your heart that you will have one of these very beautiful gifts, a gift of discretion where you can be discreet about something, not because anybody told you to do it. It's, 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 it's uh, the ability to understand the things of God without having ever have it, have it been taught to you. He goes on to say, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb, to understand the interpretation, this is the reason for the book. He's telling you why he's writing this book. That you may understand a proverb, that you may understand the interpretation, that you may understand the words of the wise, and that you may understand their dark sayings. Now this term dark saying appears periodically throughout the Bible. It's not referring to a spiritually dark saying, it is referring to a dark saying that is clothed in mystery something that has not been unlocked and you hear it and it doesn't make any sense to you. It is, it is dark. It is, your mind is darkened. It has not been enlightened to understand the saying. 
and the Proverbs are designed to, to move your mind and, and to, to, to nudge your thoughts and to lay down line upon line and precept upon precept and here a little, there a little until you begin to, to catch some things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to catch. And these are the purposes of the Proverbs. And, and one of the things that the Proverbs points out all throughout its uh, the writings are the disparity between what is wrong and what is right. And I have to tell you that that is a commission from God to the prophet of God. Uh, it is a commission that we are to teach God's people the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Uh, we are to teach God's people the difference between the holy and the profane. Uh, we are to teach people the difference between the clean and the unclean. And yes, we are to teach God's people the difference between wisdom and foolishness. Because ladies and gentlemen, there is a difference between wisdom and foolishness. And the reason that the writer Solomon wants so desperately to help us understand wisdom that's the whole purpose. I want you to understand the words of the wise. I want the Proverbs to get down in your spirit so that your mind can be sensitive to what is true. So that when you hear truth, it's, it resonates with you. And it has a certain sound to it. Because there is an opposite to truth. And just as enlivening as truth is, and as enlightening, and as joyful, and as beautiful, and as plentiful and precious as truth is, this opposite of truth, which is error, and foolishness, and falseness, is destructive, and cancerous, and, and damning. And, and, and the writer of Proverbs is saying, I have to get inside of you wisdom. I have to put in your heart understanding. I, I have to, I have to sharpen your spiritual senses to the point that when the Word of God comes across your mind, that your, your mind just grabs it and understands what God is trying to tell you. And when you're reading the Word of the Lord, the writer of these Proverbs is saying, I, I want you to perceive the words of the wise. One of the great tragedies of time is to observe the precious Word of God coming forth and not being received. The word that created all things, the word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Tree of Life Church and anyone who will hear me, hear me today. We're living in a dark world and you need a lamp to your feet and you need a light to your path. You listen to me today. We're like the, this world is like the blind leading the blind and they're going to fall into the ditch. And I'm going to tell you that that ditch isn't just a little ditch on the side of the street that you're used to. It's outer darkness. That's that ditch. It's outer darkness. And that's where they're going to fall and tumble into because people who are ignorant are leading people who are ignorant. The only thing that is true is the word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. And one of the great tragedies of time is for the Word of God in all of its splendor and in all of its glory to sweep across the landscape of humanity and people just dismiss it as, 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 as foolishness because they don't understand it, because it is dark to them. They, it's, it's locked up and they can't, they can't fathom what is being said. It is a tragedy. And so the Lord oftentimes would take His Word and clothe it in a particular a container that people might receive it and he would call it a proverb and he would call it a parable and he would create disparity in these proverbs and parables. It is a, it is a result of that emotion that he had when he looked out over Jerusalem weeping saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not let me gather you. And I would send prophets and they would prophesy and you just discarded their words like they didn't matter. And you slew the prophets and you didn't understand what they were saying and you thought you understood. And more tragic than that is if you did understand and you still 
rejected it. And we have that present in our world today. And may it never be said in the church of the living God that, that you could actually hear and understand the word of God and still reject it in your heart. My prayer today is that his word would come alive in your spirit, that his word would come alive in your mind, that his word would come alive in your heart. Oh, hallelujah. He wants us to know the difference between wisdom and foolishness. It was all, it was replete through the Proverbs. He was letting us know, listen, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The foolish man is determined to do what he thinks is best. But if you're wise, you will look to who knows what's best to do. He wanted us to know that to the fool, it is as sport to a fool to do mischief. It's like a game. Living recklessly is like a game to the foolish man. Living at a, in a place where you bring harm to others or you defraud others or you cheat others and you do damage to relationships. To the fool, it's like a game. It's like a sport to do mischief. But a man of understanding takes the time to gather wisdom and learn how he can live a life that is above that kind of thinking. The Bible says that a wise man feareth and departs from evil. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that if you are wise, you will understand the danger inherent in evil doing. You should not have to, listen, you hear what I'm telling you, you shouldn't have to have somebody get up in front of you and put their finger in your face all the time telling you to stop doing that and depart from that. It shouldn't have to be that way. If you could have wisdom, if you could have understanding, then the Spirit of the Lord could convict you and you would understand oh I want nothing to do with evil there might be pleasure in that sin for a season but that sin pleasure that lasts only for a season is about to turn into a wage of sin that is death a wise man feareth and departs from evil. If you're wise, you'll depart from evil. Today, if you're wise, you will depart from your evil ways. Today, if you are wise, you will depart from evil practices. Today, if you are wise, you will depart from sin. Oh, I feel it in the Holy Ghost. Today, if you are wise, you will depart from evil. But the fool rages and is confident. The fool rages and is confident. Just just the emotions are raging, just the thoughts of what I want and how I want to live. It rages and he goes confidently into his own destruction. And so the scripture teaches us the difference between the wisdom and the foolish. Notice what Proverbs 9 says about wisdom. Proverbs 9 says, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maiden. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Wisdom is ready for you to just enter in and enjoy the beautiful banquet of his love and his joy and his goodness. And it says wisdom hath builded out her seven pillars. That, that, that's, that's, that's so interesting to me. Notice that term, wisdom is, is seven pillars. Seven, of course, a number of completion, a reference to the perfecting power of wisdom. But it's not just seven, it's seven pillars. Pillars. In other words, this house isn't going anywhere if wisdom is building this house. Hey, husband and wife, if you'll let wisdom build your house, that house isn't going anywhere. It's going to stand strong through the test of time and tribulation. Hey, young person who's trying to launch out into life, you let wisdom build your house. Don't you fall prey to the lusts of your flesh and the lusts of your eyes and the pride of your life. You let wisdom build your house because wisdom has seven pillars that are going to cause that house to stand. And I want somebody to hear me and hear me well. It doesn't matter what lightning flashes, what thunder rolls, what rain falls. Wisdom will hold the house up. Oh, hallelujah. 
And, 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 and here's the deal. You know, the scripture really takes time to tell us, listen, don't even, I remember Brother J.T. Pugh preaching a message called, don't fool with a fool. Don't fool with a fool. And this is what the Proverbs teach us. They say, don't even deal with a fool. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 3, it says, Therefore, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Now, I want you to catch nuance, okay? I talked about nuance. I want you to notice the nuance of verses 4 and 5, all right? Let's put verse 4 up onto the screen if we could. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 4, it says this, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. What that's saying is, do not respond to a fool in the foolish way that they have acted towards you. Don't do that. Verse number five, listen to what it says. Answer a fool according to his folly. Wait, I thought verse four said, answer not a fool according to his folly. It did, but verse five is a different verse. This one says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So what is he trying to say here? It's trying to let us know there's nuance here. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Because you, when they, when they begin to take shots at you from the vantage point of foolishness, we don't respond from the vantage point of foolishness. We respond from the vantage point of the wisdom of God. So we're not going to get on people's levels. When they hate, we love. Hallelujah. When they try to do harm, we try to extend peace. And, and so, so we, we don't answer a fool according to his folly. We, our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But verse 5 says to answer a fool according to his folly. And there's a nuance here. He, he shifts it a little bit and says, I want you, I want you to speak in such a way that the fool will understand what you're saying. Answer not a fool according to his folly means I don't want you to be like him. But answer a fool according to his folly means but say it in a way he'll be able to understand it. This is the nuance of proverbial teaching. And God ordained it for the purpose of helping us understand the difference between wisdom and foolishness. Wisdom will build your house upon seven pillars and nothing can take it down. But foolishness. You know how bad foolishness is? This, let me tell you how bad foolishness is. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. You just letting any old thought run rampant through your brain. You just letting your mind wander off into any old field of folly. You just letting your mind begin to think about things that it ought not think about. The scripture says the thought of foolishness is sin. You better get those thoughts under subjection and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I want you to know you'll be happy when you do it because thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind Mind is stayed on thee. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, it's not worth being foolish. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. I, I remember the rod of correction. Now, this is not talking about child abuse. This is not talking about child abuse, but it is talking about discipline. And you, if you don't know the difference, you need to, I, I, I wish you'd have grown up in my house. We, we knew the difference. <laughs> Hallelujah. We knew that it, it listen, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't break the rules and you didn't, and you didn't just act a fool and you were taught and it was and not everything was, was brought to bear with the uh, same kind of a discipline. There were various kinds of disciplines and, and, but the Bible tells us that the rod of correction shall drive foolishness out of the heart of a child. You want to get that foolishness out of the heart of the child. It's, it's not always, you know, there were sometimes, there were sometimes when we were little that the belt had to come into play and and but it wasn't always it wasn't all the time and and so there was wisdom there was nuance there was understanding there was knowledge there was sometimes it was taking time to sit down and talking through something and helping us understand and what was happening foolishness was being driven out of our heart foolishness is inside the heart of a child and we live in a nation that because they reject this word they don't understand the power of good godly loving discipline yeah. 
and this world is now turning into an absolute an absolute uh, cauldron of of emotional rage and and there are problems on every front and people the two extremes of of no discipline whatsoever and and abusive actions on the other hand and what you actually need is good godly loving wisdom to put you square in the word of God that says because I love you I'm going to lead you and guide you and correct you and help you I'm going to drive that foolishness out of your heart and some of you never got the foolishness driven out of your heart Sometimes we still have some foolishness in us that we've got to deal with. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll give every ounce of foolishness that's in you, that you'd give it to God and say, Lord, I don't want that in my life. Hallelujah. The book of Psalms deals with parables and proverbs. Notice what, what, what Psalm 49 says. Hear this, all ye people, verse 1, give ear all ye inhabitants of the world, both low, high, rich, poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the heart. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? He was talking about the evil days. He said, when you're dealing with the evil days, you have to incline your ear to a parable. You have to incline your ear to a proverb. You have to pay attention to what the Word of God says because the evil days are coming. The evil days are upon us. Notice what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. He said to the church at Ephesus, he let them know, listen, there are evil days that are coming upon us. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly. Do you know what that means? means that means that you know everything going on around you you need to walk circumspectly nothing needs to be outside of your vision you need to know you don't need to be ignorant you need to be aware you need to watch and pray walk circumspectly you better know what's over your shoulder and you better not be ignorant of the devil's devices and you better not listen to the devil you better not listen to the devil if he's on the other end of your remote control if he's on the other end of your iPhone or if he's dressed in a religious garment you better not listen to the words of the serpent you've got to walk circumspectly but notice what he said notice the nuance notice the nuance he said see them that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise it is possible to walk circumspectly as a fool which means you're scared of everything you're frightened. You, you know what's going on and it's terrifying you and you're, you're living in total anxiety and fear and you're not sure what to do about it. And, and, and so if that's you, you need to turn things off for a little while. I, listen, I know where our world is. I know what's going on right now. And I don't just know what's going on, but I know God said it was about to happen. This didn't come as a surprise to us. We were waiting for this moment. And I want to tell you something. Now, this, this, this was a, an anniversary attack by Hamas. We're 50 years from the Yom Kippur War, and we're 75 years from 1948, the 75th anniversary of the statehood of Israel. My family was there at the time of the statehood of Israel. Not the Andrew Urshan line, my great-grandfather, but the Timothy Urshan line, my great-great-uncle. He and his children were missionaries in Jerusalem when the statehood of Israel was established, and all the Arab nations just flooded the nation of Israel. At one time, they all came in upon Jerusalem and my family, the Urshan family were Persian and they, they, were, they were just trying to preach the gospel in that area. They were ducked down in their house, laying on the floor, bullets flying through shattering windows and coming through the walls of their home and they heard the massacre and the fight and the war happening on the outsides of their home. This has been brewing for a long time and what we've experienced this last few weeks, this last week, just a week ago yesterday today. It may very well be, we don't know, but it may, may very well be the trigger that opens up the door to the war of Armageddon. This may be the very thing that puts the hook in the jaw of the kings of the earth and draws them under the great valley of Megiddo. It may very well, we know it's going to happen and we know it's been building up, but I've come to tell somebody, this isn't the time to act the fool. 
this isn't the time to be foolish. It's time to be wise. It's time to have wisdom. Paul said, see then that you walk circumspectly. That's what we're doing right now. We're checking. We're making sure we know where Israel is. We know where Hamas is. We know what's happening on the border of Lebanon. We, we understand the protests in Yemen. We understand Iran may play a role here. We don't know what the U.S. is going to do. We're watching China and Russia, Ukraine. We got, we're walking circumspectly, but not as fools. We are not afraid of this. You hear me? We're not afraid of this. We're not walking as fools. We're walking as wise. We're walking as wise. We know where we're going. We know what time it is. We know who our God is. Our God is the Lord. He alone is worthy. He alone has all power in heaven and in earth. make me want to run and hide. This makes me want to have another prayer meeting. This makes me want to teach another Bible study. This makes me want to worship and pray and preach the gospel. You know why he said to walk circumspectly as wise and not as fools? He said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We're living in evil days. We're living in perilous times. Incline your ear to the parables and the proverbs. The wise man built his house upon a rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand I'm going to tell you something it's a lot harder to get to that house on the rock it's a lot more winding curved roads you, altitude might have a certain effect on your, your breathing sometimes it doesn't feel comfortable and, 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 and if every, when, I, when we went to Yosemite a few years ago uh, we, we, we had a prayer meeting going on in the car with my wife and my daughters. We were driving and we were at about 4,000, 5,000 feet looking down and the edge of our tire was about this close to the edge of that roadway. I knew everything was fine. Not only is God on my side, but I got this. And I'm letting them know, do y'all know who's at the wheel? And if it gets too bad, I'll just say, Jesus, take the wheel. We're all right. But they were having a prayer meeting. They were good and prayed through by the time we got to the summit. But that's the way it is when you build your house upon the rock. It's not always easy. It's not always breezy. But keep on going. Because when you get to the top of that rock, nothing down there, nothing down there can affect you. Nothing down there can get to you. You've got the most beautiful view. You've got a view of all the beautiful creation of God. When you build your house on the rock. Now building your house on the sand, I, there's no way to describe how beautiful a house on the sand is. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it is so relaxing. And it is so comforting. It is so nice to be able to just, just walk out of your house onto the sand and you got the shoreline right there. It's magnificent, it's beautiful, it's easy, it's breezy, but it will not stand up under the storms that are coming. And you better hear this prophetic word from God, the storm is here. And you better not have your house built on something that shifts and shakes with the sands of time. Ideologies that come just as come and go just as fast. They go just as fast as they arrived. And vain philosophies and rudiments of this world and the wisdom of men. I know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came not to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit and a power that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man. Those are the sands. Those are the sands. But that your faith would stand in the power of God. That's
that's the rock. That's the rock. Rock of ages cleft for me. Build your house upon the rock. You know why Jesus told us that the wise man's gonna build his house on the rock? He said, that's what I did. I built my church on the rock. You know why? Because when it's built on the rock, the gates of hell. Feel the whole The gates of hell. I know you've been watching. I know you've been walking circumspect. And you see the gate of hell has just come ajar. You see that hell hath enlarged herself. You see that the gate of hell and all of it. Have you not been paying attention? Oh, my goodness. Who among you have not been paying attention? That's what's happening when they call wisdom foolishness and foolishness wisdom. That's what's happening when they call evil good and good evil. That's what happens when they call man woman and woman man. It's hell. Hell hath enlarged herself. The gates of hell have opened up. Spirits have been let loose in our world. That's why you can look at somebody in the eye and they can honestly look at you and say, truth is error and error is truth. And they, just, and they didn't used to think that it used to make sense just a few years ago. And they don't now. What happened? Hell. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. You didn't believe it and you were wrong. You thought we were making it up and you were wrong. You thought heaven wasn't real. It's real. You thought hell wasn't real. It's real. You thought there was no such thing as Armageddon. It is and it's coming upon us. And the only way you're going to make it is if you incline your ear to a parable. I'm going to build my house upon a rock. That's what the wise man does. That's what the wise man does. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to be baptized in Jesus' name. I'm going to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to seek the face of God. I'm going to fast. I'm coming to church. Save me a seat, preacher. I'm coming to church. Hey, hey, we built, we built a building. We have seats with your name on it. Get to the house of God. Get to the house of God. Build your house on this rock. The Proverbs and the parables are here in perilous times to teach you the difference between wisdom and foolishness. Incline your ear to the parable. Midnight is coming. Midnight is coming. There are ten virgins. Five of them are wise. And five of them are foolish. How do you know they're all virgins? How do you know the difference between the wise and the foolish? There's only one distinguishing characteristic. The wise knew that the night is coming and they put oil in their lamps. Hatabasha. You know, when it's daylight, you don't know you don't have oil. If you don't know, you don't know. It's the nighttime that reveals who has oil and who doesn't have oil. It's the nighttime. My God, you didn't listen. You didn't think the Holy Ghost was something real. You were wrong. You didn't think speaking in tongues was necessary. You were wrong. The Holy Holy Ghost is real. And when people receive the Holy Ghost, they speak with tongues. And we're seeing it because here comes the night. The darkness is upon us. And the only light that's shining is from those who have the oil. Hey, apostolic Pentecostal church, this isn't the time to compromise. This isn't the time to backslide. This isn't the time to thumb your nose at your apostolic holiness heritage. You better put that oil in that lamp. Ah. You've got your ear inclined to the mainstream media. 
you need to incline your ear to the parables and the Proverbs. It's perilous times. And the foolish are running around saying, we've got lamps. We, we've got lamps. We've got, we, we know scripture. We know scripture. We, we, can, we can exposit scripture. We, we, can, we can quote scripture. The, 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 the foolish are running around saying, look, look, I, I've, got, I've got all the apparatus, but I still don't see the light in this dark world because you don't have the oil. We've got to have the oil. I thank God for this building, but I don't want this building without the oil. I thank God for 11 a.m. Sunday, but I don't want 11 a.m. Sunday without the oil. We gotta have Holy Ghost power. We gotta have anointing. We've gotta have a move of God among us. Somebody lift up your hands right now in this house. Somebody lift up your hands right now. Perilous times are upon us. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Why are you having revivals? Because perilous times are upon us. Why are you having prayer meetings? Because perilous times are upon us. Why are you having a children's crusade next week? Because perilous times are upon us. Why? Why are you, why are you having life meetings? Because perilous times are upon us. Why are you giving to ready now? Because perilous times are upon us. Why? Why are you having church? Why are you worshiping? Why are you still consecrated to God? Because I've inclined my ear to a parable and taken heed to the proverb. I'm walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And in so doing, we redeem the time because the days are evil. I want somebody right now, you, you, I'm telling you, I feel this so strong in the Holy Ghost. There's been people living, you've been living foolishly. You've been living foolishly. You've been putting your faith in the sands of shifting ideologies. And the storm is about to blow everything away. Some of you have the lamp and, and you have mistaken, mistakenly believed that because you have the lamp that it's going to burn bright when the sun goes down. It doesn't burn without the oil. It's the oil that is flammable. It's the oil that is flammable. It requires the oil to provide fuel to this flame. You say, but I got it all. I, I, I really, I feel like I have it all together. Do you feel the flame? When was the last time you felt the flicker of the flame? Hallelujah. Uh, let, yeah, I know the world, the world just calls it emotionalism. And they think men can get pregnant. So stop listening to the world. Stop listening to the world. The scripture says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Incline your ear to the parable. Take heed to the proverb. Walk circumspectly as wise today, right now. Do it right now in the name of Jesus. Make a decision right now. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, right now. Come on. Come on. We got water. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name right now. If you've never repented of your sins, come on. Come on. Come on. Repent of your sins. If you need a holy, heavenly touch from God, come on. Why are these altars not filled up? Why? Why are they? Do you believe what I'm telling you? Do you believe the word of the Lord? Why do you continue to wait? Why do you continue to wait? The virgins were asleep when the time came for the bridegroom to emerge. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. A cry went out at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Go 
call ye out to meet him. Call ye out to meet him. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, go ye out to meet him. Come on, go ye out to meet him. Hallelujah. Go ye out to meet him. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, that's it. Go ye out to meet him. not my future. You are. Sickness is not my story. You are. You are. I know heartbreak's not my home. You are. You are. Death is not the end. Cause you are. You are. This is not my story. You are, you are. Heartbreak's not my home. You are. 